Welcome to the Listen Up Podcast, where we explore hearing loss, communication, connections, and health. Hey, everybody. Dr. Mark Sims here. I'm the host of the Listen Up Podcast, where I feature top leaders in healthcare. This episode is brought to you by Listen Up Hearing Centers. I help people to effectively treat their hearing loss so that they can connect better with friends and family and remain independent. The reason I'm so passionate about hearing loss is because I lost my brother, Robbie, twice. First, to his hearing loss from the radiation to his brain tumor, and then when he passed away. I am the E of ENT. I only care for ears. I've done over 10,000 ear surgeries and taken care of many more with nerve hearing loss. I'm the founder of Listen Up Hearing Center, and I've written a book by the same name, Listen Up, A Physician's Guide to Effectively Treating Your Hearing Loss. If you'd like to learn more about that, go to listenuphearing.com. That's www.listenuphearing.com. Today, I have an awesome guest. I have an audiolo- a, guy, a guy who's been an audiologist for 50 years. It's Dr. Gus Mueller or Gustav Mueller. He goes by Gus Mueller. He's an internationally known researcher, lecturer, editor, and author. He he has been uh, a fixture in audiology community for decades and has served in various roles in industry, academia, administration, and publishing. He currently has a private consulting practice nestled between the tundra and reality on the island of west of Bismarck, North Dakota. Since the early 1990s, audiologists have been treated to Gus monthly journal columns now numbering over 300. Originally, you could find it under page 10 in the Hearing Journal. Now, for the past 10 years or 12 years, it's been on with 200 with Gus in Audiology in Line, where he is a contributing editor. He's an expert on real ear measurement or has written extensively about it. And that's what we're going to talk to him about today. Gus, welcome to the show. Thank you for hey, coming uh, on. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the invite. Oh, this is great. Uh, this is a, a, a conversation I want to have for a long time because I am a um, fledgling cl- a, a clinician trying to understand. Uh, some of these concepts in academia or uh, audiology for the sake of the benefit of my patients. And sure. this is one that I really want to try to understand. So before we talk about real air measurement, you know, I had sent you uh, a note saying like, I'd like to talk about the alternatives to your real air measurement. Your answer was, here's the article I wrote that there are no alternatives <laughs> to real air measurement. I totally get that. But unfortunately, as you know, uh, or probe mic measurements, you know, as well as I do, unfortunately, many, many patients out there who are trying to have their hearing loss treated do not get that. So what are the alternatives that are being used that are being tried to use? So the concept we're talking about is maybe you could talk about verification or validation, et cetera. Well, you know, um, uh, it, it's hard to know where to start, but but here here's one starting point. Okay. And Great. that is um, manufacturers have their own um, algorithm that they recommend for fitting their specific uh, hearing aid. Uh, so, so I, let me back up just a minute. And that is over decades, um, we, we have known that there is a prescriptive way to fit hearing aids and it, it's pretty darn good. Uh, it's been verified. The procedures have been repeated and tweaked. And this goes back, uh, 45 years. And if there's a way to look at a person's hearing loss, to look at their loudness levels and decide how do we package speech uh, to get above the floor and stay just below the ceiling. Okay? And, and I think we're going to get to what are called the validated prescriptive methods um, b- before we finish our conversation. Sure. But now with that base and, and laying that groundwork, let me say that one alternative, by far the most common alternative, is for somebody fitting hearing aids is to use the manufacturer's algorithm which is in the manufacturer software. It's a one mouse click uh, and you simply click and you say to the patient very, very encouragingly, how does that sound? Okay. Uh, Or you might say, bet that sounds good, doesn't it? Um, This is, these algorithms are designed for First uh, acceptance, um, the average new users, what they want a hearing aid to sound like is no hearing aid. So what manufacturers have done is made their initial fitting sound like no hearing aid. And patients tend to like it. Now, they're not going to benefit it from they're going to not have. They're not going to be satisfied once they get out in the world. But by then, it's probably too late. They've, they've already bought into it. 
they sort of have heard that maybe hearing aids aren't great in the first place. So this is what they're left with. And they assume since they went to a major hospital or a clinic or a fancy office that what they got is as good as it's going to get. So that by far is the number one alternative. Just click and fit and and um, hope you get lucky. Um, yeah. So, so I, you know, the term that I've been told or used is first fit. Correct. Programming, right. In other words. So for the listeners here, the point is, is, is giving people a satisfactory first fit. So they keep the hearing aid, don't say it sounds bad. And with the goal more of them getting through a trial period of either 30 days, 45 days, 60 days, 75 days, something of that nature. So they actually complete unfortunately the sale meaning they get sold Correct. as compared to i think what you're referring to is is that actually doesn't get you to what you were talking about where we know what the ideal fit meaning that people right. um can actually have a prescription in their hearing aid that gives them the best hearing treatment possible i think that's correct what you know if indeed if indeed the goal was to use this initial proprietary fit um, sort of as training wheels. And then week after week after week, you ease the person into where they should be. Then I, I, I wouldn't have a problem with that. Unfortunately, that's not what happens. That's not what happens. Um, yeah, I, I, what happens I is when I learned that 90% of hearing aids have first fit programming. Yes. I was when and, I was. and because what happens is the patient comes back after two weeks or so and you say, well, Martha, how does that sound? And, you know, Martha goes, yeah, you know, it's not too bad. Well, are you going to go in and, and start raising gain to where it was supposed to be? Or you are just going to be delighted that Martha's happy and Martha wants to keep her hearing aids. I might mention um, a colleague of mine, Ron Levitt, who has a big practice out in uh, Oregon at Corvallis, uh, published a study uh, a few years ago. He does a, a, a rehab group there and people come in. People come in from um, all over the state of Oregon that have been fitted by other professionals. But before he puts them into the rehabilitative group on a Saturday and Sunday, they come in on Friday and he checks to see how well they're fitted. So these aren't people that he's fitted. And what he has found that, and I might be off by a couple percentage points here, but roughly uh, 97% are underfit by more than 5 dB and 70% are underfit by more than 10 dB. 10 dB is huge. That can change somebody's life. And these are people who have been using their hearing aids. Yeah, especially, you know, one of the things that I found very hard to get a good concept. So for the listeners, the, the audiologic scale is log logarithmic. And so what that means is about every three decibel is a doubling in the sound intensity. So exactly. when, when you say 10 dB, you mean one doubling and then another doubling and then a double doubling and then more. Sure. And sure. That's a huge difference in terms yeah. of what you, you know, in in uh in 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 many cases, we we look at just noticeable differences, and that is, you know, a JND and 10 dB is a lot of JNDs. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and and relative to what what you're um uh, saying, uh, Mark, is that it also um, it also has to do with why these hearing aids have to be carefully programmed is because let, let, let's take somebody with a 50 dB loss, which right. is not uncommon. And just to keep it simple, we'll, we'll say it's a perfectly flat audiogram, uh, equal loss at all frequencies. It usually isn't, but it'll make the picture easier to see. If th this person then, when fitted correctly, is going to need about 30 decibels of gain for soft sounds because we need to put soft sounds above the floor to make them audible. Right. But a person with a 50 dB cochlear loss, and 95% of them are going to be cochlear, their loudness level is that their for loud sounds is the same as somebody with normal hearing. Doesn't change. Doesn't start going up till a 60 dB loss. So there, the point where loud sounds first become uncomfortable is around 100 dB. So we have what used to be when the person was young, a uh, 100 dB window to package in the world. We now have a 50 dB window to package in the world. Between loud enough and too loud. Correct. Right. In between audible and loud, but okay, but not too loud. 
So th this takes very careful programming. Uh, and what happens is with these first fits, they tend to be geared to make sounds sound okay for average. But when you do that, soft sounds will be inaudible and loud sounds will probably be too loud. And the patient will try to fiddle with the volume control if they even have a volume control. And they rapidly then become unhappy, uh, which is why things need to be carefully programmed. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. You know, I've had a lot of discussions uh, both in the show and with other people about low adoption rate. Why, why are there, you know, so as as a ballpark, as you know, only 20% of people with a treatable hearing loss treated. And, Correct. you know, um, and there's a current movement to say that it's price, as you know, because the over-the-counter market has just opened up for a point of timing of when we're having this. Um, I, I think it's peer experience. I think that people talk to other people and those people are not as satisfied with their hearing rehabilitation that they don't say, hey, yeah, you should do it. I mean, that I didn't know anybody who got an iPhone who told me I shouldn't get an iPhone, right? Everybody right. said, things are great, go get one. That's not, unfortunately, the typical peer experience or, or patient experience is to say like, hey, I have these hearing aids. This is the greatest thing since sliced bread. You should go ahead and do it. It's actually the exact opposite. People say, I don't know anybody who's happy with their hearing aids. Yeah, well, it, it, exactly. And as I just mentioned you from, from that Oregon study, if, if that, that larger percentage of people is underfit, you wouldn't expect them to be very happy. Right. And, uh, and then they, and you better believe, as you say, they're, they're going to tell all their friends, um, when their friends are going to say, Hey, Joe, I thought you got hearing aids. Yeah, they don't work very well. I don't get them. Well, you know, Frank isn't going to go out and spend $6,000 when he just heard that from Joe, uh, cause Joe's his friend. Yeah, um, I say I say there are three groups. One got them and returned them. Yeah. The second got them and put them in their nightstand drawer. The third wears them and says they don't hear any better. And yeah. so those are by and large people's peer experience rather than people like saying, This is great. I needed these. These are awesome. Yeah. I, I have to say, if I don't know if you follow um the Market Track 10 surveys. And uh, for our listeners, these are um, th these are available online. Um, they're not uh, hidden away in a in a journal that's hard to access. And it's so it's Market Track and the late uh, Market Track Ten, uh, which came out about two years ago. There's some real there's some encouraging things in there that that we have a long way to go, but there's an encouraging things that that we're getting better. Yeah. Uh, people who had just gotten hearing aids in the last year. And granted, many of them were not fit correctly, but for listening in quiet, something like 90% of them are satisfied. For listening in background noise, I, I was surprised at this. The satisfaction rate is um, gone up to in the 70s, I believe, 70% or so. Um, 20 years ago, I think it was 30% for listening in background noise. So it's baby steps, but we are making progress. What we hope is that those people are now telling other people that hearing aids really do work. Yeah. So, and we'll touch with this with realtors. So the, the, the way I present it to people is, is that just means that they believe that their hearing loss is less bad <laughs> with hearing yes. aids, not ideally rehabilitated. Right. And so for the listeners, market track is a repetitive uh, market survey that that the industry does about people and their perceptions of hearing aids and you can correct me if i'm wrong probably the only thing i think about it that it doesn't give us access to are the people who don't have hearing aids it actually surveys the people who do have hearing aids no that isn't that isn't correct mark okay. um they have a whole separate section of people with admitted hearing loss okay. who have not purchased hearing hearing yeah. aids, so I guess and, I, and so what what they uh, which which is very interesting because they have a whole now it isn't you know it isn't a purely matched so right. the ones with you know they you don't know that they have the same hearing loss as the others but they have a lot of comparisons of people um, with hearing aids who comparing them to the people say, I have a hearing loss, but I haven't gotten hearing aids. And there's some yeah. really interesting things relative to quality of life, um, socialization. Um, and, and, um, it's, um, it, it's an interesting area to look into. If I were, if I were in the business of, uh, selling hearing aids, uh, it would be one of the first studies that I would show potential hearing aid users to, sh to show there really is a difference there. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I should stand corrected. My mind was wrong. It's the people who are unaware of hearing loss of their hearing. Right, loss. right. You yep. have to be yep. aware to get yep. it. To, 
And so, yes, you're correct. Like, so in other words, they're comparing the people who know they have a hearing loss, haven't done anything about it. The people who have a hearing loss and have done it. Correct. Who admit they have a hearing loss. Right. But of course, there's this whole group who don't think they have a hearing loss and they they really do, which is a large group. And so there are other things like some practitioners think they're doing, like where they'll um, speak to patients or take them out into the environment. What type of other things? Do, I mean, I can't. Yeah. And what other types of things do people kind of do? Well, you know, um, there. Well, w- w- what would seem like a logical thing to do, except it doesn't work, uh, is to do speech testing. Right. Uh, because you, you I mean you, you think about it. If if you go to an optometrist and and you and you you complain you can't see from distance or close or whatever, you know, before you leave, they usually give you a chance to make sure what they're fitting you with really works. So people come in saying that they can't understand speech and background noise. It one would see, it would seem logical that we would do speech and noise tests um, to find out what is the best hearing aid. Um, it, it, although it's logical, it doesn't work for a variety of reasons, um, partly because the tests aren't quite sensitive enough unless you have really big differences. Um, it would take a long time because, you know, when do you stop? Uh, you program it this way, then you program it this way, then you program it this way, then you try this model hearing aid. You know, it could go on forever. And the third maybe important thing is that there isn't a real high correlation between uh, how somebody performs in a clinic to a standardized speech test to their benefit and satisfaction in the real world, where there are so many other factors that that enter in. But uh, relative to alternative approaches, I, I suspect that there are some places that um, do the manu- manufacturer's first fit, um, sit the person down in a test booth and do a speech test, probably a very easy speech test, and the patient does okay, and um, and they're out the door. You know? right. right, and we'll talk about it because I there might be a role after real air measurement, but that's oh, a, absolutely, that's nice, right? absolutely. It's a great a great counseling tool. Right. It, right. It, it's 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 a nice way to show that hearing aids work. I just don't think it's a very good way to pick the best fitting for a given patient. Right. I I agree 100 percent. And so you know, one of the things I and you can correct me because you are really facile at this stuff. You know, as you know, in in um, uh, hearing loss, presbycusis, the hearing loss of aging, typically involves a larger high tone hearing loss than low tone hearing loss, and that's actually one of the largest complaints of uh, patients when they're immediate fit is stuff is too loud in the high tones, too tinny, and they don't like it. And in a response to that, uh, the first fit algorithms that the manufacturers have actually kind of decrease, particularly the high tone gain because of that complaint. And that then makes them underfit, particularly in that region. Is that the case? That is absolutely true. And you, and you can take out the word kind of. Um, they <laughs> drastically, drastically right. roll off the highs. There's a second reason for that is because if you roll off the highs, your feedback reduction system doesn't have to be so right. good. Uh, and what you'll find, there's a relationship between the manufacturers have who have the better feedback reduction system won't roll off the highs as much as the ones who have a really crappy feedback reduction system. But but anyway, back to your point, um, uh, Mike Valente, who a well-known audiologist and researcher who uh, is out of the University of uh, Washington at St. Louis, um, recently did, a, this was a peer-reviewed publication, crossover study. He looked at the average um, error I'm going to call it, where where people were not fitted to prescriptive using the manufacturer's proprietary uh, approach, what you've referred to as fit, fit, first fit. Many people have in the high frequencies, the mean at 4000 hertz was um, 20 dB below prescription. Wow. At 3000 hertz, it was around 15. At 2000, it was around 10 dB. So as I say, they don't kind of roll it off. They Most do. of them drastically roll it off. You know, and, and you're right. You're right. If, if you fit a person correctly, it is very possible that right at, on the initial programming, the comment that you will get is, uh, wow, this sounds tinny. This, oh, geez. And, you know, and it should. These people haven't heard these sounds for 15 to 20 years. It should sound tinny. 
That's what I tell them. I tell them it's like, you know, going from a dark room to a bright light. Your yeah. ear and brain aren't used to it and it takes time. And that's why yeah. when I ask patients who come to me who are um, not happy with their hearing aids, I always ask, well, how much follow-up did you have? And uh, many of them, it's one fit. And so I call it first fit and forget it, right? Oh, you're good. Come back and see me if you need me. Yeah. Well, you know, when I, I was in private, I was, but I dispensed hearing aids in the uh, U.S. Army for 20 years. Um, people didn't whine as much then because they were getting it, getting them free. Uh, but then when I, I went into private practice for five years and, um, and, and, and of course I heard that, that common complaint and my, my line to them, I don't know if it really worked or not, but it was the only line I had was, uh, you know, I'm not trying to make you happy for the next five to 10 days. I'm trying to make you happy for the next five to 10 years. Of course. Right? So stick with me. Stick yeah, with no, me. I, I, your brain, your brain will catch up. It's just going to take a while, which is all the more reason you need to wear these hearing aids, even when you're in quiet, um, because uh, the brain's a pretty amazing thing. Um, recently, there's you probably have followed this. There's there's a lot of documentation, one of them coming from a new Sharma out of University of Boulder, uh, looking at changes in the temporal lobe following hearing aid use when the hearing aids were correct correctly fitted um and maybe not so much when they weren't fitted correctly yeah I, I think that that's actually one of the things that um really wanted me to get you as a guest right like so there's a lot of policy being thrown around right now where the underlying little asterisk is this all makes sense if the hearing aids are actually appropriately fitted and programmed and unfortunately that's a really big asterisk because most of them aren't so you know, it's a big problem, right? You have to have sure, it sure. fit right before, you know, getting the instrument doesn't matter. Getting the instrument with the correct uh, programming is highly important. Yes. I, you know, I, I, I travel a lot and, and usually, you know, if, if I'm lucky enough to get bumped up to first class after about the third Chardonnay, the guy next to me elbows me. And so what do you do? And of course, <laughs> as soon as I say audiologist, uh, the, the old days, they used to go, what? But now they say, yeah, I need hearing aids. What brand should I get? Yes. And my answer is the same every time. It's not the brand. It's the person doing the fitting. Uh, you can pick the best brand in the world, and it will be a piece of crap if it's not fitted correctly. Uh, it makes that's, a huge, that's, that's great. You, you know where that resonated with me? Uh, the first time I really hit home. I mean, it's kind of a it's a cult pop cultural reference, but uh, in the new Top Gun, um, uh, Tom Cruise, its character looks to one of the younger guys and he goes, it's the pilot, not the plane. Right? <laughs> yeah. Or well, by analogy, it's, yeah. it, it's the mason, not, not the bricks. It's the yep. painter, not the paint. I mean, yeah. people know that it's the skill of and But that's what the companies want. They want us to think sure. it's their widget over somebody else's. Yep. Widget. And that and that's unfortunately. Um, you know, I, I can see where the average consumer thinks of it that way. Um, they, they they think of it as a commodity. Uh, and, 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 you know, and, and I can tell you, audiologists are partly to blame for this by bundling everything when, when they started selling hearing aids. You know, they, they started to use the, I'd say 80, 90% of audiologists use the model that was used by hearing aid dispensers. Uh, and that is just to bundle everything. I think had we separated from the very beginning the cost of the hearing aid versus the cost of our services, I think our services would be valued more now and people would see see the value, you know, because there would be a dollar amount. I mean, it, I think now people think that they're 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 you know, it's the widget that they're buying. And th th this other person there just stuck it on their ear and pushed a couple of buttons and and they're not all that important. You know, it's going to all come true when we hit over the counter hearing aids. We're going to find out how, how how important we are uh, or not. Well, I think, you know, frankly, you know, I mean, my take on that is, is, is if you're going to charge multiples of thousands of dollars and give people the exact same hearing experience as somebody who can go get an over the counter that's auto programmed, you, you're, you're out of luck. I mean, yep. you're not offering yep. people value. It's going to be the people who are doing all of the other things that are going to be, I mean, it's interesting, you know, we, we, in our home, we've had a, a very talented Polish uh, carpenter. And uh, he is always charged um, our labor plus materials. So he mm -hmm. always takes the labor or the materials out, has you pay for that. And then he shows you what he charges you for labor because he's smart because he sure. knows 
these more expensive rather than these people who kind of bundle and push down. But you know what? The beauty is just, you know, as a quick aside, I never have to ask him to do it twice and I never right. have to correct his yep. work. Yep. And that's really what you're looking for. Yeah. And especially this is your healthcare and your brain, not, you know, look, I want, yeah. I, want the, I want the door to hang right too, but that's not nearly <laughs> as devastating as not being able to. I know, you know, and, but, but the average consumer just doesn't know any better. Uh, is the sad part about it. Um, well, I, I think if they knew the difference, then they would demand better service, I think. Yeah, well, I always say you don't know what you're not hearing. Sure. So, I mean, that fundamental concept, um, and I think actually to some extent, we have fallen into that trap um, with things like uh, surveys and things like that. So, you know, when you when I go back and look at some of these surveys in the literature, you know, some of the tests, the, the studies show that the survey results don't correlate with the audiogram, which means patients' subjective assessment of their hearing loss does not correlate with the objective measurement of their right. hearing loss. So then why do we try to get people to like tell us, I mean, I get it motivates them to treat, but the answer is, is even if you don't perceive your hearing loss, you have an objective thing called hearing loss and you need to treat it. That's kind sure. of it. Absolutely. So yeah, it, it's, it's definitely, I, I think, you know, I'm trying to, that's some of the stuff in the book that I'm trying to get to. I don't think it's as easy for people to do it, but people ask me all the time. That is exactly right. What brand should I get? And so the other question I would say, I say, what brand of plywood is in your home? And they kind of look at me and I go, you don't know. And they're like, right. Yes. I said, you entrusted the carpenter to put the good wood in and put it in correctly. And so you have to stop. It. But, you know, these multi-million, billion dollar corporations, they certainly want you to think their brand matters, right? It's yeah, you know, and and there's there's uh, there, there have been several studies where where they take the big six, which I guess you could argue is now the big five, but um, th let's take the big six because there's still six premier products, and they they've programmed them all the same, okay, right. um, to to the prescriptive target that that we mentioned earlier, uh, and when they do that, the differences among products is very small. Um, be, because they all sort of are the same, you know, but as soon as they start using their proprietary fits, which are all somewhat different, then you start to see big differences. And of course, it's always lower than the prescriptive fitting um, that, that they, they could have had. Yeah. So it's interesting because I spoke to another clinician who was talking about maybe not on first fit, but, and that's why I was talking about hearing and noise that they do see some performance differences when they're doing hearing and noise testing with an appropriately prescriptive fit. And we can talk a little bit about that. Or those differences are gonna be small. I'd say, you know, I've consulted for a hearing aid company for 30 years and I've, I've worked with their clinical trials. And in the clinical trials, we always pick the, the brand that I'm consulting for and three competitors. And we run the four, um, you know, they, we run them against each other. And the, when, you, when we have 24 people, we can get a statistical difference. But in the clinic, um, these differences are, are small. Right. Um, if, if, you ask, if you ask the average audiologist uh, what brand has the best noise reduction, the best directional technology, whatever, the answer is always going to be the brand that they're buying the most of. But but you don't know what come first, you know. Did, no, no, did you the start the, the rep that I'm the base friends with? So it's it, but it's a yeah. Uh, so anyway, <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, the one who took me to Hawaii. Right. <laughs> no, no, I no I'm, we won't go that far. That would be unethical. Well, but, but the, but the fr but maybe. I, I, and, and I understand what you're saying. But on the flip side, let's be honest, right? If you ran a company and doing those things didn't work, you wouldn't do it. So. I, I understand yeah. what you're saying, but it obviously creates influence. And I'll, I'll leave that as a, that's a bigger bite off. Oh yeah. Yeah, it is. But, but it, I'm just saying that, you know, I look at these, um, these um, audiology uh, Facebook pages and that where people are saying, who's having good luck with um, noise reduction. You know, it, it isn't about good luck. There, no, there, there, there's, there's published articles that right. tell you exactly which one will be the best. No, it's right. about luck. Yeah, I, I agree. I think the the hard part, obviously, is as you know, the it, it, things are changing, and so that's actually one of the interesting things. Um, and this is a comment on just the overall industry as there's consolidation and the manufacturers start buying practices, uh, then practices get wedded to one particular product, regardless yeah. of whether or not that company has at this particular time the best product sure. available. And that's actually one of the reasons, yeah. as a philosophical thing, we we 
as a as an organization won't do that because we want to be able to offer whatever is sure. the current best technology. You know, th- there's as I say, I was in private practice for five years. There's a very good reason to probably only fit two brands uh, be- because they're they're difficult to program, and you need to have something that you're familiar with because you, then you will indeed do the the best for your patients. Right. And so you know, there, there's a good reason for that. But hopefully, before you ever picked those two brands, there was some background research that went into it. Right. Fair enough. I, I agree 100 percent. And I think that that's a very uh, s- systematic and uh, a really wonderfully reasonable way to approach it. And obviously, uh, you've thought about it and uh, you've been around this uh, industry for quite some time. So we've been talking about uh, real air measurement or probe mic verification, I think, is the other term that you use. So can you, um, and obviously the the punchline is, is it should be used. I mean, I think there's no ambiguity to that, but can you talk a little bit about the history of the development or the thought behind sure, it? Sure. Where, where did some, at some point, you know, ultimately we're trying to make sure that people are getting presented to their cochlea and their brain, the uh, optimal or right amount of information. That's the underlying assumption, unless I'm misstating it. Yeah, no. so, but what was the evolution and what was it before? Like people were thinner sitting around and somebody must have you know, said, hey, we should try this, right? Yeah, well, well, as I, I said earlier, there's, uh, let's just take one, one method that's by far the most popular. There's a, a second method, but th- this is by far the most popular with adults. And that's called the uh, National Acoustic Laboratories method, normally just referred to as the NAL, uh, that was developed in Australia. The first publication was in uh, 1977, I believe. And so this relates, th- they came up with a way that you could take a person's hearing loss, maybe also look at their loudness levels and you could come up with a prescription of how much gain that they should have in those days hearing aids were linear so you only really needed one gain number and then it was well how do you know if you got it right well until 1983 or so the only way we knew that if we got it right or close to right is we had to sit a person down in a uh, in a test booth and we would test them unaided, then we would test them aided, subtract the difference, and see if we had the desired gain that was called for in in the prescription, okay? Um, A test reliability is terrible. There's a lot of variables, but it's all we had. Uh, So we were delighted uh, in the early 1980s when uh, probe microphone measures, real ear measures, they're all the same, when they came along, and uh, there was a group of us, I guess we would be considered the early adopters that, uh, you know, put in our budget to buy four systems, you know, or whatever, whatever we could get, uh, right. because that was then the way. So we had this prescriptive method. And now uh, test free test, by the way, on on pro microphone testing is about two dB. So now we have a very accurate way to see if what we want at the eardrum is really at the eardrum. Uh, And so then over years, hearing aids developed and the prescriptive methods developed so that we didn't have just one single gain value per frequency, but we had targets, prescriptive targets for soft sounds, for average sounds, and for loud sounds. And again, our probe mic equipment allows us to measure that very precisely, uh, again, within a couple dB of accuracy. So you, you have you need two things. You need you need a, a gold standard and we have that. And then you need a tool to see if you're meeting the gold standard. And and the only tool we have to see if you're meeting the gold standard is real ear measures. There, there isn't a plan B. There, there is no other tool. Agreed. And, and so can you can you describe the actual um uh, technology or the machinations sure. of what we do when we sure. do it. Yeah, there's um, what, what you hang, you, you hang on the ear, a device that has two microphones. Um, the one microphone is a monitor microphone, regulating microphone that makes sure that if you are presenting, you're presenting a sound from a loudspeaker. And this assures that if indeed you say, I want a signal of 60 dB, that it really is 60 dB right as it enters the ear. So this is like a calibration. Pardon me? On the outside of the ear. On the outside of the ear. Okay. okay? The second second microphone has a uh, tube attached to it. 
um, probably about 50 millimeters or so, I'd say is the tube. Um, and what you do initially is you calibrate this tube, which then and the machine corrects for the effects of the sound going through the tube. And the tube, tube becomes acoustically invisible. So it's like you're putting the microphone down by the eardrum. So what you then do very carefully is you slide this tube down the ear canal. Uh, probe, probe mic uh, systems in just the last few years have a very convenient little device that sim because they do, they look for um, waveform cancellations as you're sending this tube down the ear canal and it shows up on your fitting screen and it will tell you when you're five millimeters uh, from the eardrum. It's the and if you're in, on in, your in, car. <laughs> pardon me? It's the backup camera in your car. Yes, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Except more precise. <laughs> I wish it would go down to five millimeters. I have a but tight fit in my garage. Yeah, no, I know, but it's pretty darn, it's the same concept <laughs> as you're getting closer. That you exactly, exactly. And so what happens then, uh, so now, now you, can, you can do the measurements as if the microphone was right at the eardrum. So now you're ready to roll. So now you, you have your fitting targets of what it should be. So now you can take the hearing aid and you do a pre-fitting, uh, if you're going to fit to this prescriptive method I, I mentioned, you would pre-fit it using the manufacturer's algorithm, which isn't very good, by the way, which is why we have to do the pro mic measures, but at least it's a starting point. Right. And so then what you start doing is delivering a real speech signal, not real speech, but it's a signal that has been designed to mimic average long-term real speech, okay, right. which is called the LTAS. Uh, and you deliver that signal and you look at the output at the eardrum. Uh, and what you, so and how it compares to the targets that are on this screen. And what so you on the then screen, do you've taken, I'm sorry to interrupt, you've taken yep. their prior audiogram and correct. put that in to show what you have to get. Correct. The the probe mic equipment. So we have two two things going on. We have the fitting software, which is sitting over here. And what we have then right in front of the patient is the is the probe mic equipment, which also has its fitting software. So you enter the person's hearing loss into that. You 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 tell the um, that equipment some other things about the person. Are they a new user or experienced user? Because the fitting algorithm adjusts for those kind of things. Uh, the one algorithm even adjusts whether it's a male or a female. Males like things just a little louder, only a couple dB than females. Um, if it's a kid, you would put in what their age is because their ear canal acoustics um, are different than an adult. And so you enter in uh, all of these factors. And then the, the pro mic equipment calculates the fitting targets. And those fitting targets will then uh, be on the screen, usually for soft, average, and loud, along with the patient's um, the, the patient's hearing loss, which will then let you know if you're making things audible uh, for for the patient, and it corrects everything to ear canal SPL, which is way too complicated for our talk right now. But just trust me, it does a good job, and so everything is in ear canal SPL. So the audiogram is upside down to weigh. We're used to seeing it, but it's the right way around to make sense. Loud sounds are higher and soft sounds are softer. So most everybody's audiogram is upward sloping. And so what we then do is run these curves uh, and, and try to match the three different targets the best we can. Um, on a good day, you like to be within 3 dB. Most fitting guidelines say if you're within plus or minus 5 dB, you're probably okay. Uh, usually we like to get just a little closer than that, but plus or minus five is uh, a patient doesn't start noticing the difference too much until you get greater than five dB. And so is there literature that came to that conclusion that three dB is what you want or how? Did well, that... the three dB really started with one particular manufacturer uh, and then people had sort of latched onto that. I'd have to ask them. That's the Verifit equipment. Uh, right. I've actually dug through the uh, well, and there when and actually, I have to say the algorithm, algorithm, the now algorithm in some of their uh, research of 10 years ago, they reported in that research that if you're plus or minus three dB from their target, 60 percent of people, uh, it should be at their preferred loudness level for 60 percent. Um, 20 percent should think it's too loud. 20 percent should think it's too soft. 
Well, so that's one where than, the 3db came from. Certainly a lot better than people who are 20 db off or. Yes, off or <laughs> absolutely. Or absolutely. And, and then 5db, I think, are in fitting guidelines just to be a little more generous and realistic um, that a lot of times, particularly with, let's say, a downward sloping loss where it drops down to 75, 80 in the highs, mm -hmm. getting within 3 dB might not be realistic for that. Thanks for tuning in to the Listen Up podcast. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get updates on future episodes.